Hi, I'm Paige Perez de Almeida, and I'm here at Cloud Connect Silicon Valley with Dave McRory, who is the SVP of Platform Engineering at Warner Music Group. Dave, thanks for joining me after your keynote for a couple questions. Thank you. So the, the first one I wanted to, to kick off with was around sort of this idea of big data. It's, it's a buzzword that has been percolating for some time now. What do you see as the biggest misconception about big data? I think probably the biggest misconception is the idea that big data will somehow uh, magically solve all problems and give us all answers to all questions. Um, big data isn't really what's uh, isn't really what's of the utmost importance. It's really the information that we can get. Uh, so, data doesn't mean anything uh, unless you can do something with it. And to do something with it, you have to turn it into information, apply it to some level of knowledge that you have, and then take action on it. Um, so, having lots of data. Uh, is the equivalent to having lots and lots of crude oil, but you'd like to put that in your car and drive it, and there's a refining process that needs to happen before you can do that. Sure. So in your talk, you talked about uh, data plus context equaling information, and data and information are not, in fact, equal. That's right. And we're part of the IT industry very intentionally. We're not part of the data industry. Given everyone's focus on data of late, do you foresee that changing? Um, I foresee it changing in time. I think the, uh, I think it goes back to people failing uh, at being able to answer any and all questions that they would like, um, just based on saving up a whole lot of data. Uh, it's having the right question and being able to answer it based on the information that you generate. So you have to take data and uh, process it or refine it to turn it into information by applying that context. Um, and I think that big data uh, is lots and lots of bits of data, but it's not information. And I think that uh, I think that's being lost right now. Uh, people are saying we're going to apply analytics to all these large amounts of data, and we can get all of this great uh, all of these great insights. You may get insights, but uh, they could be wrong. Mm. Uh, there could be uh, there's the idea that correlation is not causality. Um, so just because you correlate two things doesn't mean that one caused the other or that they interact in any way. Uh, the problem is people are going to come to the wrong conclusion, I think, quite a bit. So I think we'll see lots of failures and then, uh, and then people will come to the realization and that's when we'll see, uh, that's when we'll see kind of the information revolution uh, that, that spawns from big data. Mm -hmm. It kind of gets into the difference between being data-driven and data-informed, you still have to leave some space for people to cognitively interpret the data. That's right, that's right. We can't, you can't leave it all up to, uh, to the machine to make all of the decisions. Uh, well, you can, but you can have disastrous results as we've seen in the news and everywhere else where mm -hmm. uh, trades and things were made uh, by algorithms and it caused all sorts of cascading failures in the financial systems, uh, trades, all sorts of things. Uh, so we do need uh, some, uh, some human guiding, guiding hand at some point to, uh, to apply additional logic to, to things. Sure. So my final question for you, in your, in your talk, you sort of spelled out data gravity and how it can be, if you sort of play with it, you can alter a desired outcome. Could you, could you just illustrate for us an example of where you've seen data gravity used to, to alter, a, to create a new outcome? Sure, so uh, one, of the, one of the many cases uh, is I if you consider when people decide to move to uh, uh, caching content or something like that in, in a cloud, uh, initially uh, they end up with very uh, poor performance of an application or they're using a service and they're not getting what they need and they end up implementing caching. Caching simply moves uh, the, the most important information closer to, uh, to the user. So if you think about something like Akamai or something like that, mm -hmm. um, it's creating many copies of the data closer to the people that need it, the, the end users. Maybe it's Netflix, uh, you want to watch a movie. Uh, that movie has to be, uh, has to be applied to a, a CDN, a content delivery network. The reason for that is if we all tried to download our file from, uh, let's say it's, it's in Iowa, uh, if you're on the other side of the world, 
um, it's going to take a very, very long time to get to you. Mm -hmm. But if there's, a, if there's a copy of that content that is at a local internet service provider, you're going to get it very fast and it's going to seem instantaneous to you. Uh, that's where, by applying a data gravity uh, technique, uh, people benefit directly. Uh, effects of data gravity, uh, if you look at Amazon EC2 East, uh, there have been uh, continuously there have been outages where there's one problem with one service and there's this effect of all of these other services going out mm -hmm. and people wonder why everyone puts everything in EC2 East. It's because that's where some of the m most popular services have uh, uh, have begun and so those services uh, strongest and biggest data set and the most interactions all happen there so if I'm going to build something else on top of that where do I want to put my things as close to it as possible, which would be back in EC2 East. Sure. So that's another great example of, of, of it having an effect and someone being advantaged by choosing, even though there's risk, to put themselves there so that the end users can get the best experience possible. Great. Well, Dave, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me and look forward to learning more about your research into data gravity. Thank you very much. Thanks.